This lecture will be about the Mordell Bay theorem. So I will start by recalling what this theorem says. So um, Mordell, more than a century ago, showed that if we've got an elliptic curve, um, let's call it E, over the rational numbers Q, then the group of points on the elliptic curve with rational coordinates denoted by E of Q is finitely generated as a group. So I just quickly remind, um, recall what this means. So an elliptic curve will look something like y squared equals x cubed minus 2. And we can ask, um, what are the rational solutions of this? For example, it's got a rational solution of y equals 5 and x equals 3. Um, and the number of rational solutions may be infinite, but um, Mordell showed that, the, that they form a group, and this group is actually finitely generated. So um, just recall what this group structure looks like. If we've got an elliptic curve, it might look something like this. And if we've got three points on the elliptic curve with rational coordinates, then we say that their sum is equal to zero if they lie on a line, a straight line. So here are the points A, B and C, and in this case their sum is zero. So I'd better make a couple of comments about this. First of all, this sum has nothing to do with adding up their coordinates. This is defining um, a group operation of addition on the points of an elliptic curve. Um, secondly, this doesn't quite define the group structure because I haven't said what the origin of the group is and you can just pick any point on the elliptic curve to be the, the, the origin of the group. For example, you could take the point at infinity. Um, so Mordell proved this finite generation for points of an elliptic curve over the rational numbers. Um, this was generalized by André Vey, who um, changed elliptic curves to abelian varieties. Um, and it was extended further by Lang, who um, showed that you could change q to any algebraic number field. Um, there are also versions of this over rational function fields, but you have to be a little bit more careful about that. Um, so the proof of the mordell vey theorem um, basically follows Mordell's original argument with some various improvements, although Mordell would probably not have considered them improvements. So, um, first of all, we prove the weak mordell vey theorem. So, what for this, you take the group of points over the elliptic curve and multiply them all by 2 using the group law on the elliptic curve, and we get a group E of Q over 2 E of Q as the quotient. And the weak mordell vey theorem says that this group here is finite. So if E of Q is finitely generated, this group obviously has to be finite. And the converse is not doesn't automatically follow. For example, if you take the group of rational numbers and multiply things by 2, then you get Q over 2Q. And this is certainly finite because it's just the, the trivial group, but the rational numbers are not finitely generated. So the weak mordell vey theorem by itself is, is not enough. And to get the full mordell vey theorem, we also need the height of a point on an elliptic curve. And what this says is that E of Q has a symmetric um, bilinear form. Um, and this has the following property that um, it's more or less positive definite. So A, A is greater than zero if A um, is not a finite order. And the key property is that, the, that there are only a finite number of points on the elliptic curve with rational coordinates with um, any um, with, with bounded with, with value of a bounded by some fixed constant. So if you fix any constant m like a million, there are only a finite number of points um, with length at most of that, where of course the length of a point is just the square root of its um, the inner product with itself. Um, so 
um, the first thing to do is to check that properties one and two imply the full Mordell Vey theorem. So we're going to show that properties one plus two implies Mordell Vey. And for this, what we do is we pick a set of points A1 to AN representing all the points of E of Q over 2 E of Q. So these points here are, are rational points on the elliptic curve, and we pick enough of them so that um, every point here is represented by one of them, which we can do because uh, we we'll recall this group is finite. And now we pick M. So um, all these points AI have length less than M. And then we're going to show that E of Q is generated by the points A of length um, um, at most M. Um, and this argument is very easy. Suppose we've got any point, then we can write um, this point X as 2Y plus some AI. Um, this is just saying that um, the AIs are a set of representatives for the, the curve modulo 2 times the curve. And now we notice that if Y has length greater than M, then X has length greater than Y, because A has length at most M, and 2Y has is going to have uh, is going to have length at most the length of x plus the length of a i. Um, we can rewrite this as saying that y is less than x unless x um, has length at most m. Um, and this shows that every point x can be written as a linear combination of points of length at most m. And you do this by induction. You keep rewriting x as 2y plus ai with y less than x. And you can keep doing this until x has length at most m. So you can reduce every point to points of length at most m. So this shows that the um, full mordell Vey theorem follows from the, 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 the two properties I mentioned. Um, now we discuss the, what, what is the height of a point. So for an elliptic curve, um, you can embed it in the projective plane. And then it's got projective coordinates x, y, and z. And if the point is rational coordinates, then we can assume x, y, and z are integers. And we can also take them to be co-prime. And then we can define the logarithmic height to be the logarithm of the maximum of um, the absolute values of x, y, and z. And this isn't quite the height we, we really want. So h is approximately quadratic. Um, so in particular, h of 2x is approximately 4h of x. Um, and um, you can actually work with this approximately quadratic function, in fact, which is what Mordell originally did. Uh, it makes the argument a little bit fussier because you need to keep track of what the error terms um, for this being approximately quadratic is. Um, take notice that you can make it exactly quadratic by sort of averaging it. Um, you define h hat of x to be just the limit as n tends to infinity of h of n x over n squared. And then um, h of x just turns out to be um, um, the inner product of x with itself for a suitable bilinear form. Um, for abelian varieties, this is rather similar. Um, what you've got to do is embed the abelian variety A inside projector space um, for some n. Um, and if you've done algebraic geometry, you know that to embed something into projective space, you need to choose a line bundle on it. And line bundles um, give you lots of projective embeddings. So you choose a line bundle on your abelian variety. You probably want this line bundle to be symmetric. Um, and this gives you a bilinear form. And if L is ample, 
whatever that means. This turns out to imply that the form is um, positive definite except on torsion points. So this is essentially André Vey's contribution. He, he showed how to how to extend the height to um, um, more general abelian varieties. Um, so um, for elliptic curves, um, the, 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 the there's there's basically a smallest possible ample line bundle, so there's no real real choice involved here. You, you essentially just put your elliptic curve into projective space. Um, for abelian varieties, you get quite a lot of different heights depending on which line bundle you choose. Um, next, we want to discuss the weak model Vey theorem, um, where you take an elliptic curve and you map it to an elliptic curve by multiplying it by two and look at the quotient. Um, in fact, more generally, we can work with an isogeny from the elliptic curve with itself, from one elliptic curve to another elliptic curve. So suppose A and B are elliptic curves, or for that matter, abelian varieties, and we choose a map from one to the other, which is an isogeny. That, that means roughly it has to be surjective and um, it has a kernel, and we want this to be finite. So isogeny roughly means that the kernel is finite and, and the map is surjective. Um, um, so, for example, if we multiplied by any positive integer, that would be an isogeny. And there are also some other isogenies related to complex multiplication, which you don't need to worry about. And what we want to show is that B of Q over lambda A of Q is finite. And for this, what we do is we take K to be the field over Q generated by the coordinates of the points um, x with lambda x um, um, being a rational point of b. And we find we get an exact sequence. 0 goes to the kernel of lambda, goes to a of k, goes to the image of a of k, goes to 0, where this is contained in b of k. And what we can do is we can act on this sequence by the group G, which is just the Galois group of K over Q. And here we've got an exact sequence. And if we take fixed points under this exact sequence, we get zero goes to the kernel of lambda over the rational points of this, which is a finite group of very small order. And this maps to A of Q, which maps to and the lambda to B of Q. And this map isn't surjective. Um, taking fixed points under a group action is only left exact. Um, instead, um, this maps to a certain cohomology group, which is H1 of G, the values in Kerr lambda, which we won't worry about too much. But what we notice is that B of Q over lambda A of Q is um, a subgroup of this group here. So um, what we want to do is to show that this group is finite. Um, well, the kernel of lambda is certainly finite, and a first cohomology group of G with coefficients in something is finite um, is finite if G is finite. So we want to know, is G finite? In other words, um, is the degree of this field extension k over q finite? And if we um, do that, then we've finished off the proof of the weak model of a theorem. So I'll explain how to do that. So what we've done is we've reduced our problem to the following. So k is generated by the coordinates of points x with lambda x having rational coordinates. And these coordinates lie in fields with the following properties. First of all, the degree is bounded. 
you can bound it in terms of the degree of lambda. Secondly, you can check that it's unramified outside a finite set of primes. Um, so um, what you do is you've got a few bad primes and the bad primes come from the following. So first of all, we, we, we take a model for um, um, A and B over, over the ring of integers of some number field and ask for which primes do they not reduce do, do, do they become singular curves when you reduce modular that prime? So these would be points of bad reduction. And there are a finite number of those. And then we can have um, primes dividing the degree of lambda. And then we want primes to make various rings into principal ideal domains. So you know if you've got the ring of integers of an algebraic number field, it's not usually a principal ideal domain, but you can make it into a principal ideal domain just by localizing it a few primes. So you add in all these. And this gives you a finite collection of bad primes. And you probably throw in the prime two as well, because the prime two always goes wrong. Um, and thirdly, these extensions are abelian. In fact, the Galois group turns out to be a, a subgroup of the additive group of the elliptic curve. And if you take these conditions along to your friendly neighbourhood algebraic number theorists, they will get very excited and um, give you a long explanation involving class field theory of how there are only a finite number of fields with these properties. And um, in fact, they will list them all for you. In fact, you don't really need class field theory. Um, one, two, and three. Um, imply a finite number of fields, which you can just do using comma theory. Um, what you're doing is you're looking at abelian extensions, and you can get all abelian extensions by first of all throwing a lot of roots of unity and then taking nth roots of various elements of your field. And the, 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 the number of roots you take n is bounded because the degree is bounded, and the, the, the number of possible a um, is, is reasonably bounded because um, the field has to be unramified outside some set of primes. So A can only be divided by a finite set of primes. And this, this means there are only a finite number of integers A. And then you've got to fuss around the roots of unity of the field being finitely generated. But that, that, that's a, that's a well-known theorem. So um, proving there are a finite number of fields with these three properties is, is a, a routine piece of algebraic number theory. So that shows that this, this field K is a finite degree. So the, the, the Galois group is finite. And so that funny um, cohomology group is finite. So that completes the sketch of the proof of the Mordelvey theorem. Um, well, there's one very annoying problem that this is actually not effective. It doesn't actually give an algorithm to find the points. Well, actually, it probably does give an algorithm, but rather annoyingly, we can't actually prove that this algorithm always works. Um, so what is effective? Well, things we definitely can calculate. I mean, we, we definitely have an algorithm for. Um, first of all, the height is completely effective. The set of bad primes, S, we can list explicitly. We can find the field k over q quite explicitly. And we can calculate the group h1 of Galois k over q um, with coefficients and kernel of lambda um, um, explicitly. It's, it's, it's not very difficult to calculate. It's, its definition looked like a bit of a mess, but in practice it's quite easy to handle. Um, um, we, we think of this as being a known, fairly easy group. And the problem arises when we were looking at aq over lambda b of q and we had an injective map from a of q into this group here. And um, the problem is, what is the image? And, um, well, what's the problem, you say? Well, if something is in the image, it's actually quite easy to show it's in the image because you can just calculate until you find a point mapping to it. 
The problem is if a point of this group isn't in the image of this group, then it's not clear if you've got an algorithm to solve this problem. Um, the obstruction to this is a group called the Teicher-Farovich group, um, which is um, notoriously difficult to calculate. It's believed to be finite, um, or conjectured to be finite, and seems to be finite in all cases we've been able to calculate it. And if it's finite, then we can calculate the image of this group uh, in, in an effective way. If it turns out to be infinite for some elliptic curve, then we'd be kind of stuck. And actually, this would be really interesting and really annoying, and people would have to completely rethink everything they know about elliptic curves. Um, so the Tainter-Farovich group is at the moment the problem to making this um, effective. I, I should say in practice, we can always effectively find the um, group of points of finite order on an elliptic curve. We're just, we're just not certain that this algorithm always works.